Okay, good morning. Good morning. My name is Gary Matsuoka, and we're here at the Bunny Holes Nursery in Santa Ana. Today's class is going to be about um, installing plants in the landscape and in containers and repairing plants that you get from growers other than ourselves. So um, let's, let me just go with uh, how many peer were not at last week's? Okay. You saw it on. Yeah. Okay, so you know, we believe that the best dirt is this sandy loam material, not the uh, compost. We're growing plants in. We grow our own plants in something a little bit lighter, but still made out of mostly quartz, which is our top pot potting soil that we sell so that the root rot is not promoted by that soil that we use, whereas almost everybody else in the trade is right now using compost as a growing medium and it costs a lot of root rot. So we'll uh, kind of deal with that too. But first let's start with, uh, let's start with, if you have a, a tree say, or a big bush in a 24 inch box like this, that's a big container. In fact, they shouldn't make them quite this deep because plant roots in the ground only go down in the ground about a foot, foot and a half. Well, this is almost two foot deep inside. So you've got roots now in the box. They're fine because the wood is somewhat permeable and there's a lot of holes all throughout this box that the air can get into. So the roots on this tree will be mostly at the bottom because that's where the moist, most moisture is and a lot at the top too. But when you put that in the ground, it's gonna to be too deep. So what uh, what we've been told quite a long time ago, so let's just draw the ground here. And uh, now generally you don't wanna, you want to uh, have the root ball of this sitting right at surface level or slightly above only because you don't want it to be below the surface. That's the main thing, not below the surface of the ground because the water has a lot harder time going through dirt into this root ball than it does uh, if this is exposed. So that's the main thing, the main reason. Don't want, well, we don't want to cover the trunk too high either, although it's not critical. A lot of people, a lot of places, they tell you, don't put dirt on top of it. Don't let anything pass the trunk. Well, we haven't found that to be super critical, but getting the water into the original root ball is critical. So you want this whole root ball to be sitting maybe an inch above ground level. So when you make your hole for a 24 inch box, and we're gonna take the box off, you make your hole, well, this is, so the 24 inch box generally will have about a 22 inch root ball. And there'll be a couple inches of clear space at the top. So you don't want you want your hole to be about 22 inches deep. You want the bottom of the root ball sitting on firm soil, not something you've dug. The reason for that, if this is soft down here, if you soften up and you water, a lot of times it does sink. You want this to be real firm soil right below the root ball of. You know, 24 inch box trees or even 15 gallon trees, you don't want it to be soft underneath there. You don't want that thing to have a chance of, uh, of uh, sinking when you water it. You make your hole about a foot wider so you have room to work with this. Now, if you're planting a 24 inch box yourself, and I've done it, then generally you make one side more of a ramp so you can lower it in better rather than just drop it in. So I'll dig a hole on one side, I'll go like this. So I can have the box sitting here and then just drop it, slide it down into that hole um, if you're working by yourself. And if you're like contractors, they might have a crane there, just lowers the tree into the hole for them. So what we usually do, before I put it in the box. So this box is held together by these uh, bands on the sides but the bottom is hammered on. So you can just uh, just get a hammer and pry the bottom boards off. You watch the nails. And then leaving these bands together, then you just drop it in the hole without a bottom on it. Now, 
some contractors leave the bottom in the hole. It's not a big deal. This three pieces of the wood underneath the tree, it's, it's not going to cause any trouble, but um, I like to take the bottom boards off, drop it in, and then you kind of turn it to get facing the way you want it. Make sure it's level. So you can, you know, if you have to, you can throw some rocks underneath it to get it up a little bit. Um, and then you get a, um, there's metal cutters you can buy. Cut the bands and the sides just fall right off. They're not hammered together or anything. And then you just fill on the side. So now the Department of Agriculture knew 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, that these are too deep. So what they had us, what they recommended that we do is get perforated PVC pipes and put them on all sides so you can maintain the airflow to the bottom. Now, they recommend a two-inch perforated PVC. I haven't seen that size. I've seen three-inch, four-inch holes in it. I guess you can get two-inch pipe and drill holes in it, but I haven't seen perforated two-inch pipe. But what I would, what I did is drop in three-inch perforated pipe that has holes in it, fill them with gravel, put them one on each side of it, so you can maintain airflow to the bottom roots, so they don't suffocate and die when you fill the hole back in. Because this, because these roots are too deep, kind of only go down about a foot. So one on this side and one on all sides, and then backfill with the native soil. Now. Um, some contractors do it a different way than that. So you can do put the pipes in there and then backfill with native soil. But a lot of the big contractors, when they're doing, like when they did the LA airport back in the 80s, um, they put in even, you know, even bigger boxes, 36 inch boxes that are 36 inches deep and 48 inch boxes, just too deep. But they, you know, they had these huge trees going in. So they just backfill the hole to the sand. And I've had contracts tell me that's one that's their standard practice. They backfill this hole with sand, the air gets down to the bottom of the hole. No matter if this is clay or not, the air gets down there and the roots can breathe, they won't die. Otherwise, you know, if you just backfill with dirt and you don't have these air pipes there, what will happen is over the next few months, you lose all the roots down deep. So the trees are sitting there, it's growing new roots, you know, into the soil around it, but it's at a standstill until it grows enough to make up for what just died down there. So if we do this, or backfill with sand, or back, you know, you can use our top pot, it's area than sand is more expensive than sand, but sand is about one quarter the price of our top pot. So you can, you know, do that, then you're not going to have any problems that way. Now, once we do this, your water with, with the hose, um, it's nice to build a berm. So you're gonna have a lot of extra dirt in this hole. So you just build a berm right outside the edge of the root ball, all the way around. So then when you water it, you do capture the water and the water goes in here. Because if the water goes on this side, it gets sucked out by the denser soil that most soils are denser than this, the soils are using containers. So they act like water paper. The water goes that way. It does not go this way. So if you water right through the root ball, the water will get go into here and then get sucked out into the native soil outside. Now, if this is all natural dirt or our top pod or sand, even if the water sits in here, it's not going to rot anything. But unfortunately, most of the growers' soils have a lot of compost. And if the water, if this is really bad soil, like go up to Rancho Santa Margarita, it's slate. And what those people have done is keep their plants alive, is they maintain these open holes. Uh, these pipes are open and they put a pump in here and pump the water out after it rains. Then there's this city in here. Most other areas, if it's clay soil, the clay will actually absorb the water 
and get it out of there. And if it's sandy soil, you're fine too. But I've had arborists tell me that they, you know, in the areas of what well, they told me, Mission Viejo, uh, uh, they're trying to save the person citrus tree. So the deepest they said they've ever had to drill to get the water out of the hole, uh, 25 feet. They drilled straight down next to the plant, 25 foot deep hole, back of gravel to get the water out of there because the soil was just holding it too much. But generally, we don't worry about that as much. Uh, most soils here will absorb the extra water. Can you uh, check the roof wall to make sure it isn't moved down? So you, you probably need to store the roof before you put it in or not? Well, okay, so what the uh, tree experts are telling us, it's not, unfortunately on trees, once you get them this big, you cannot uh, fix what's already occurred. So the they say that the worst part on trees is if the nurseries that were growing the trees did not watch it when they were, when they were small. So, uh, what I mean by that is that when we grow trees, the first container we use is about that big when you grow a tree. And a lot of times they'll put a cutting or a seed in there. And if the roots do this in there, you can't fix that. If they loop around in the pot like this, it's a, it's, there's no way. So as the tree grows, this gets thicker and thicker and thicker and it, and it just cuts itself off. So most tree growers, you know, use containers without a bottom, so the roots can't loop around. So there's no bottom on the pots or there's a lot of holes, so the roots don't loop around in there. So if they can avoid that part, because if it, if it goes in circles in this big pot, it's not as problematic unless you, well, the main tree that they say is a problem is eucalyptus, because eucalyptus, if they start doing this, they never do make straight roots from the trunk again. Most trees, even if they have roots going around and around, they will make new roots that are straight. But they said eucalyptus are, it's like a big spring in the ground. So that's one of the reasons they don't, you don't see eucalyptus being planted as much anymore because they have a bad tendency to fall over and kill people uh, or break branches and kill people on top of that. But uh, that they said, they, they, this is what they claim is that they do not start new roots from the trunk like most trees do. They'll just go on the ends of the, the the roots they already have. So what we were doing in the 70s and 80s, pull them out of the pot and then stretch the roots straight and then put them in the ground. Because um, they claimed it didn't, they never repaired themselves, but we planted money in many other trees and that they never had problems. Ash trees, alders, they seem to make new roots in the trunk that are nice and straight and sturdy. So yeah, you can't, we don't really do much scoring on the root ball. Now, if this is really bad soil and it's a grower that used too much compost, I'll remove a lot of that. Uh, what we found on plants, and we'll show you on when we do repairs on some of these, we found that you can take off half the soil of the root ball and the plant won't flinch. If you take off all of it, yeah, you gotta make sure that the plant's not in shock. Now, if it's a deciduous tree, you can take it all off. It's probably not going to, you know, it's not, it's not using any water at that moment. You can really mess with the roots and, and get away with it. But for any plant with leaves on it, you've got to be careful uh, not to overdo the damage on here unless you have the ability to shade the plant for, for several weeks. So we'll talk about that when we talk about the recurring plants. On the PVC, the PVC, what kind of um... Put gravel in there. And I say put gravel in here so it doesn't fill up with dirt. Okay, and then I just kind of put some two black tape during the rain. Is it too late to climb? Not at all. So, yeah, it, the roots don't suffocate immediately. It, it takes them several weeks to, to start dying from uh, being planted too deep. Last question Do you need to put a cover on the top, the opening of the tree? I do. Yeah, okay. and the hole on three inch and four inch pipes are so big that if you step on it, you can trip. So you just get drain caps. They sell drain caps that fit right on these and put them on. Thank you. 
Yeah, um, some landscapers think this is how you water the tree. No, it's it's not for water, it's for airflow. So, I mean, you can water there, but then the water goes straight down this way and the roots are going this way. It's, you're, you're not watering a very big area if you put them in down the pipes. You got your tree up here. Now, this is the prime time if you want to stake it to stake it up too. And generally, we do not recommend anything thinner for a large tree than a lodge pole. Uh, these generally don't break. Most uh, redwood stakes that are thinner than this uh, snap in the wind. They're not strong enough. Uh, some landscapers use rebar, but rebar tends to wobble more if it's thinner. So these uh, don't even work. You know, if you have your hole dug, you just drop them in the hole. Once you water a few times, it's pretty stiff. It's nice to go a little deeper with these. So we found out, I found out when I was around 30 years old that it's uh, much safer to get a big auger bit at the hardware store and drill a hole to drop these in than to stand on a eight foot ladder and do the hammering. Because <laughs> it takes about, you know, even with a sledgehammer, it takes sometimes 20 minutes to get this down deep in the ground. Uh, now they do make these expensive metal um, sleeves that fit right over here with panels on it that you can, you can act like a hammer that you can do that with. But still, you find that you get the nice electric drill and you put a, a, a two inch auger, one and a half two inch auger on the end of it. And you drill a hole in the ground and you just drop in. It's just way easier. In theory, the best way to stake a tree is not with stakes, it's with guy wires, but Everybody knows guy wires are just too dangerous in the public. You'll forget they're there. You can't see them at night and you trip. So, so we don't use guy wires that much. Now to tie a stakes. So when you stake up a tree, we're supposed to use not a stake on the trunk. Uh, a stake right against the trunk is like putting your arm in a cast. It never gets stronger. It actually makes the tree weaker to have that stake there. So it's better to stake the tree on two sides, say a foot out from the trunk, and then tie it. Now, they make special ties to go that distance. Some people even use metal rods that are shaped to, for this purpose. What I always done is taken green stretch tape. I should have brought a sample up here. But the green stretch tape and go around the trunk about loosely about six or eight times and then take a rope sometimes they'll hang the rope on the branch to make it easier but take a rope and go through the stretch tape and tie that to the stake this way the rope's not on the trunk of the tree the stretch tape is so that the rope doesn't cut a hole through the trunk because anything you put on the trunk that's that's solid will the trunk will actually, it doesn't put a hole in the trunk. The trunk grows around the solid objects. So it, it gets embedded after a while. So what we do do, you know, you, sometimes it takes a year or two for the tree to firm itself up and up in this hole. Um, and so if I leave the the ties on here, I will re untie it and retie it at least once a year so it, so the trunk, the bark of the tree doesn't uh, grow over the ties. That's... Some people use a uh, rubber gaskets, and they are pretty effective. Yeah, they don't choke the tree. Right. I like this method better because yeah. sometimes you can't find those. You know, they make the rubber things with the wires on the end. Sometimes they're not long enough to stretch the distance I need. So this way, I can do more of a custom job. That's always worked. I've always done it that way. Usually put the fertilizer on top after we plant. Most fertilizers are fine. It's not a big deal. And then uh, water it pretty thoroughly. 
and then keep it well watered. Now this year with all the rain we're getting, it's like we haven't watered the nursery in a week now. I'll probably water it this afternoon because it's it's going to be 70 over 70 degrees today, and we haven't watered since the rain stopped, so it'll probably need it now. Generally, the smaller plants, like if you planted uh, bedding plants in the ground, they can drop fairly quickly if, if it's a warm day. So you have to water those uh, once a day at least. Now we try to, for the bigger plants, well, you want to maintain the moisture level all the way down to the bottom of the root zone. Uh, the only way to check that is with the stick. There's no moisture meter that will go down that far. So if you have a bamboo stick or a metal rod, if you can push it all the way to the bottom of this hole, it's wet all the way to the bottom. If it's dry, you can't push it in. So you can check it that way. Most plants will have a shorter root system. You know, one foot is good enough for most other plants to keep the soil moist about a foot deep. Now, a lot of plants don't have to stay moist to stay happy, but if you want it to grow fast, uh, and or and or be productive, then it's nice to keep it moist at least a foot deep and on the big trees uh, as deep as root ball is. Now, um, we have to watch the watering quite carefully until it's established. Now, what we mean by established is that the root ball, the roots grow out of the root ball far enough that they can get up the water. Now, say if you plant one of these, this with this two inch root ball. Roots can, you know, the roots can grow adequately in say two weeks or even one week. They come out of here half an inch and they may do that in one week if the soil is warm. Then most of the roots are now outside the root ball and they can grab the water from the soil around it. This big tree here though, if it grows roots half inch out, most of the root system is still in here. You're going to have to water it. Make sure this is well watered for probably a couple months rather than a couple of weeks for a small plant. Even one week for a small plant may be plenty. But you want to make sure the roots are out of here because the root balls that come with the plants dry out much faster than the soil around them because they're coarse. The soil is coarse. It doesn't hold as much water. So you have to watch them for, you know, for a short time at least or on the bigger plants for a longer period. So big trees, they'll grow out maybe two or three feet in one year, but once they're out about a foot, you know, this root ball, once they're out about a foot, which may take three months, four months, five months, most root systems now outside the root ball. And it's gathering water from the soil around it. Now, irrigation wise, um, so farms learned a long time ago that light frequent irrigation is more efficient than deep infrequent watering. And uh, we don't know why the water districts don't tell you that. I guess they just don't want you to water, but uh, on farming, they found out there's no disadvantage to light frequent irrigation at all. If you water deeply and infrequently, a lot of that water goes too far down, roots never get it. They're too wet for three days of the week. You know, if you water once a week real deep, they're too wet for three days and too dry for another three days. So uh, they're, you know, it's just not as efficient as watering lightly every day. And they said the, um, the deep infrequent irrigation did not make the roots go deeper. They made them grow shallower. So the light frequent irrigation resulted in a deeper root system. So they said, yeah, there's no disadvantage to light frequent watering at all. Um, essentially, what you're doing, this is for farms, you're topping off the tank. You don't let this run dry. You let this run dry, uh, the plant just doesn't grow, doesn't produce. You always want to maintain a good moisture level, which for most plants is about a foot deep. Now, again, if you don't want them to grow, or produce, let it run dry. A lot of natives are used to that. You know, they don't get any water in summertime. It just gets dry on them. They just sit there and tolerate it, but they won't grow. They won't flower. They won't do a lot of things when it's dry. So if you want it, if your goal is to make them grow well, maintain it at a foot moisture. Again, if you get a metal rod or a 
any stake of any kind. If you can push in your ground about a foot, right where you're watering that plant, it's moist foot. If it's dry soil, you cannot push anything through it. Okay. What does light frequent irrigation mean? I mean, light has to do with doing on a disk system or a sprinkler, how many minutes? Or well, sprinklers, yeah. If you're using sprinklers, the maximum amount of time you should leave sprinklers on for one cycle is four minutes, according to the water district. Because that's about as much as the soil will ever absorb. But within an hour, you can absorb four minutes of sprinkling. You more than four minutes, it just runs off or puddles into into one spot in your yard, and it's less efficient that way. So if you're watering with sprinklers, they say four minutes. Uh, in the middle of winter, like January, February, four minutes is all any plant needs mm -hmm. for the entire week. With the, with typical January weather, which is sixty nine degrees, February weather. You know, uh, March here it's supposed to be seventy degrees in the daytime. It's not much different. Uh, or four to maybe eight minutes a week is all the plants will be using that week. Once you get to April, then the water use starts going up. By July, we're using about 10 times that much, uh, 11 times, 44 minutes. They say in Orange County, say this part of Orange County, typical 85 degree day, 44 minutes of sprinkler irrigation to maintain that soil moisture at one foot deep. The minutes. Right. That means you have to water a lawn more than once a day. Yep. If you water 40, four minutes every day, you're four is only 28 minutes. So divide it like if you're doing two or three times a day. Whatever it equals. Whatever it takes. I mean, you can do uh, three minutes twice a day every day. That'd be six times seven. That, that's about right. And an hour apart. You need to give the water an hour to soak in, and then you can water it again. Yeah. That's hard to do. You have to be out there a long time. <laughs> no, in pot. In pot. Well, but how long do I try? So the water comes up. Well, if I have it, my team is 22. Well, you have to figure it out. So generally, one inch of water will penetrate over an inch of potting soil. Will moisten over an inch. So if you have a pot that's two foot high, you go, okay, if I fill it two inches on the top, it shouldn't make it all the way through. But you'll have to check, check that, if, you know, just by experience. Put two inches of water in there and see it comes out the bottom. It comes out the bottom, you're, you're, it's wet. It's nice in a container to always flush it through whenever you water. Otherwise, because, because our tap water is very salty, you get a salt buildup somewhere in the pot if you don't walk, flush it all the way through. In the ground, you can't do much about it. Uh, we depend upon uh, five inches of rain and shortage of time to push the salts through. <clears throat> <laughs> this year, every rainstorm is doing that. <laughs> we tell them we get a rain, we're getting like four or five inches of water, and it's there's no salt in the ground this year. It's flushed out. The last two two years have been terrible. Salt builds up, you get all the brown tips on your plants, and the salt that's in the tap water. Is that what it means when you get the brown tip? Not always. Uh, salt buildup can do that. So can having no roots. So if you don't have good roots, then you get that burning on the end of the leaves because the plant just can't pick up for enough water. <clears throat> so this is for container plants, um, especially ones that we didn't grow. Now, if it's a smaller plant that we did grow, like a five gallon, or if we grew a nice one gallon plant, no matter what soil you have, the soil we use is so airy. You just make a hole big enough to put that in the ground, whether it's sandy soil or clay soil, and it's fine. You can use the extra soil to make a berm so that the water goes in. <coughs> in a five gallon bucket, the roots aren't too deep. A uh, five gallon bucket, the roots are about 10 inches deep. So you don't have to do anything extra to get the air around to the bottom. Just make a hole, drop it. And now, again, if it's not something we grew and it's in compost, then it's nice to get the sand around or something area around it to prevent that compost from rotting underground. 
or else you can fix it when you plant them. We'll see how to do that in a moment here. But that's it. Or a thing I, a friend of mine again, who was a landscape contractor for 40 years, he says we just always backfill around the plant with sand. Nothing rots when it's surrounded by sand. That air keeps the compost from causing trouble. <clears throat> is what he claimed. So if you're if you're planting in a pot, all you do is you you want to, again you want to make sure that the root balls of these plants are roughly at the surface of it. So you don't want them bury this too deep, bury the stems too deep. Um, so you keep it near the top, and the rest of it's just our top pot. Now, you know if you've been to our last lecture, pure sand works as potting soil just fine. When we did our initial test, sand beat everything. It's just that you put sand in here, it would weigh about 160 pounds, which is good in some instances. If you had a tree in here, 160 pound ballast, though it'd be hard for the wind to blow it over. With our soil, it'd weigh about 60 or 70 pounds. So our soil is quite a bit lighter than than dirt or sand. I mean, my dad grew all his plants back in the 1950s and 60s using sandy loam. So truthfully, we didn't sell many plants in containers in the side because there's no way you can lift them. We sold a lot of plants in five gallon and one gallon and in the boxes because we used dollies to move those. But very rare. I mean, they didn't even have containers this size back in those days. They were all metal. We are using uh, cans from the food industry, uh, one gallon cans and five gallon true cans, which were about the same dimensions as this, but they were square. So they were a true five gallon. This is only 3.8. Because it's they you know it's easier to make plastic round than square, but the old fashioned square metal food contain food cans were five gallons. You filled that with dirt, and it was it was heavy. So that's why the industry now uses compost because it's way lighter than dirt, but it's causing a lot of trouble on the plants. Okay, so when we grow plants and when my dad grew plants, you pull them out of a pot and you can see the white roots. So you know this is in our soil because the roots was really healthy. In our soil, it's fairly light color, it's not dark. Um, if you get it from other growers, like this plant, this is from one of our growers. It used to look like this when we first got it last fall, but over winter as it grew, the soil is just deteriorating on it, and it looks like that. Uh, there's very few healthy roots left on this plant. I see a few white ones right at the bottom, but on the sides here, it's like, no, oh, they all turned brown. So the plant started to look pretty ugly. Uh, when the soil is fresher, the plant looked a lot better, but as it's as it's aging, the soil is now this is from a different company. They have slightly different soil mix. The roots are still fairly healthy, but not you know they're not white. I mean, in the old days, you pull a plant out of pot, they were white, beautiful roots. Um, now some roots aren't white, so it's interesting. This one here, they're yellow, nice yellow roots. And there are some plants that naturally have black roots too, but most of them are fairly white. Uh, some of the plants we have the most trouble with, like we grow Ceanothus in our soil because if I buy it from the grower and compost, it ain't gonna make it. It just doesn't make it. Ceanothus is easy to repair. We just rather start with a with, uh, small young plant without the compost run than grow ourselves and you get a beautiful root system uh, that's nice and white again. So we expect these to you know grow four or five foot a year, but this way, not this way. This is a short, you know, this. Uh, fuchsia is another one that's real hard, uh, real sensitive to soil. This one's in 
not in good soil. It's it's still fresh, so the roots still look decent on here. Um, but we'll have to change that. If you want to have a good fuchsia, uh, it's, it's nice to get it out of that soil eventually. Now, plants that are in pots this small, this this little bit of soil here, two inch root ball, it's not going to damage the plant. It's not enough compost to really hurt this. I mean, if it's a lavender, it still dies when you have the wrong soil even that much, but most plants don't care. And if you get a plant like a, um, this is daylily, this is in pure compost, but the roots look pretty good. Daylilies are, seem to be immune to root rot. So there's plants like Antations, daylilies, roots, and, well, roses rot, but they, they readjust the root system so quickly they don't appear to have any columns at all. And then you have plants like uh, blackberries that root sucker. So even though this soil is not very good, although it is rather skinny, we don't really worry about anything this thin because it's such a small column of, of compost that it's not going to cause major trouble with this plant if it's surrounded by decent soil. Plus, the, the blackberry is going to move over here within a few months. It'll come up over here and over here and over here. It's, it's migrating out of the root ball. So plants like that, uh, all the berry, uh, blackberry, raspberries, uh, plus uh, canna lilies and a lot of other lilies, they migrate out of the soil that they're in. And here with these blueberries, you find that this is not enough compost to hurt this blueberry. We've done a lot over the years by, you know, I would spend like half an hour teasing the, uh, the blueberry roots are really tiny seizing the bark and stuff away from the blueberry roots and not doing that and not seeing any, enough difference. Once the blueberry's in a pot this size, if it's in this soil, it's going to kill it. You've got to get it out of there. But blueberries are a pain to work with because the roots are like hair. <clears throat> They're really delicate roots. Some roots, like citrus roots, are like rubber, <clears throat> rubber, you know, a lot of them are this thick and they're like rubbery. It's really hard to hurt citrus roots. So that, that's one plant that's easy to do uh, work with. Like this plant here, what we would do to get it out of the soil, this is kind of a pain to, you know, I use chopsticks, but it is kind of a pain to do this. Uh, for a plant this size, I would just get the hose out, put a little nozzle on the end, one of those shutoff valves, and turn it so it's just a fine but strong spray and just spray it off. It's much easier on a small plant than that. If you work with a plant a pot this big, you're gonna waste a lot of water. But on a plant this size, it may take 30 seconds of, or even 20 seconds with the, with a strong stream of water to get all that soil off of there. And then you put it in the ground or in a pot in normal soil and uh, it won't turn yellow and fall apart in the future. We don't grow our own fuchsias. Fuchsias are a little bit tricky because sometimes a uh, girl will get hit by a fuchsia mite and there goes the entire crop. It's hard to stop fuchsia mites. Okay. Um, well, let's, let's demonstrate how we do some of these. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> We learned a long time it would be real rough with bougainvilleas. So if you shock a plant by pulling the soil off the roots, there's two things the plant can do. It'll wilt roll bad, and that's a bad sign. Or shed all, all its leaves, which is actually a good sign. If the plant's shedding leaves, it's doing that to save itself. It sheds its leaves, drops its leaves, and says, okay, I don't have any water coming up. My roots have been chopped. Uh, I'll just shed my leaves and wait until the roots grow back before I regrow my leaves. If the root, if the leaves just wilt, you're in big trouble. If the plant didn't have time to shed its leaves and it just dries up and dies. So uh, you have to watch, you know, be careful who you uh, work with the plant's roots. What the plants? I mean, we grow our own bougainvilleas, but we don't grow all the different colors. So if someone asked us to get an orange one. Uh, they didn't pick it up, so I have it here now. But we know if we leave it in this soil, 
not the worst soil I've seen. It's sand and bark. Um, and some growers use like 100, 90% bark. This is looks like it might be 30, 40% sand. The rest, some kind of wood shavings or bark. But generally, if you leave it in this soil and put it in the ground or leave it in the pot, uh, the roots will be so ugly in here after a year that every winter for the next five, 10 years, the plant just goes to sleep and the winter drops everything because they can't. Uh, it's just not enough roots to keep that plant happy when it's cool. Now in the summertime, they usually look okay, but in the wintertime, <coughs> they'll drop their leaves and, and flowers and just go to sleep and then wake up again when the soil dries out. So if we take off the soil, then they tend not to do that. They tend to bloom year round, and you know you'll see blooming vias that are always looking good year round. Then you'll see other blooming vias that just go bare in the winter. They're bare in the winter. They're in compost. Mm -hmm. uh, what we think that does to them actually is because roots can't live in the compost because there's not enough air down here. They're at the very surface. But if they're at the very surface of the soil, and it's winter time, those roots get too cold, and the plant shuts down. Whereas if the roots can live in this, they're deeper and they're immune to the cold. So we think that's what the reason is. Uh, and in a pot, the roots on this plant after a few more months, the center of this root ball gets too dense and mucky to grow roots in. So the roots start staying either on the surface or on the sides where there's no air gap. <clears throat> but those roots are more exposed to the cold too. So they so in a, in a in a pot in this soil they go to sleep in the winter. If there are soil, they can live in the center of the pot where it's more insulated, then they stay awake. Now this winter was really cold, so most of the bougainvilleas went to sleep anyway. I guess was you know forties day most of the day and nights. That'll put most of the tropical plants to sleep. <clears throat> now the way we work with these larger plants. <clears throat> is just especially with bougainvillea. Now, what I'll do is trim it down a bit. That takes a bit of the stress off. But so, if, if I were to put this in, in say, in a landscape, I would probably trim off. up to half, but that takes some of the stress off when I shake the roots clean of dirt. We have some moving bees right outside our front gates. This is essentially what we did with them. I had one of my employees do it, and he, he, he was sure they were gonna die. So we did that to them, and I just told them to just get the dirt off it by dropping it. Now, this isn't working as well as it would be if it was on cement, because <laughs> this is too bouncy here. A little tiny crane mansion walking in the mountains. Okay, so chopstick helps. So this big piece is about to break off. I don't want to tear too many roots off. Now, on a lot of plants, what you'll find out is that when the plants were grown in the pot, the grower bought a plant that was maybe that size root ball and put it in there to start with, and the roots do this. They go down the bottom and come back up the sides. That's how I see most of these root balls shaped. They wind around the bottom, they come up the sides. And here you see the, the size was in a smaller pot before, and they put in a bigger pot. So there's several layers of roots. So if I was dropping on this ground, there'd be much larger cracks in here, but 
table is not working as well. Now, when I first started doing this, I used back in the 90s, I used water. In those days, we didn't have a water shortage, and we had a larger store. Uh, it's actually an eight acre store. Then we had a three acre store, and I just went out to the back portion of the store that was dirt, and I would just hose this off slowly. The water is the most gentle way to remove the soil from roots. But we don't like to waste water nowadays. Most nursery now use uh, pollen. Some okay, you're talking about Promix, which is the best of the soils that we see other nurseries use, which is it's Promix is about 80% heat, which is okay, and 20% perlite, which is okay too, but it's too much, not enough permanent material in there. So even those I'm not, you know, if they're in small pots like one gallon or smaller, it's fine. Uh so there are a lot of bedding plants grown in Promix. Not too many bigger plants are, although I think Altman's, which sells to a lot of chain uh, stores, uh, uh, uses Promix. So those are the, and Promix is more expensive than this compost stuff. So, you know, the more, ex, you know, there's a few nurseries that use it. It's still not anything as good as our top pot, but it's the best that anyone else uses. They like a lot of peat because, you know, you go to a chain store, no one's watering the plants. So they have to use that peat moss to keep the plants as wet for as long as they can. So it's got better shelf life. But after about a year, that peat moss is turning to black sludge and eventually causes some trouble. But at least it's not. There's no disease uh, associated with the decaying peat, like there is with decaying wood. Decaying wood, you get mushrooms, fungi, bacteria, all kinds of stuff going on that's not good for the plant that's sitting in it. So we sell your brand up with the next question. I haven't seen anything else. I have not seen anything else. Um, yeah. I mean, we've been to a lot of nurseries locally, but I uh, haven't seen anyone use soil that we would we prefer. I had a supplier down in the Vista area, Fulber, uh, Fulber, no, Vista, and they were using, um, they were making their own mix out of peat moss and perlite. So it wasn't pro mix, but they were just mixing up their own. So going in the pot, would you recommend if you, you can't get them, I mean, get the hand on the pot, would be somewhere. Like someone doesn't live around here. And would you recommend permit in the pot? Oh well, not for perma applications. You know, if you have a flower or vegetable, the pro mix is fine. Live say more than a year or two, and the pro mix can work for that. But for a tree or shrub, no, you just make your own stuff. And again, pure sand works for most plants and pots. And everybody can get a hold of that. Um, sponge rock, most people have access to sponge rock perlite. Uh, and the coarser perlites are almost as heavy as pumice rock is. Uh, the finer grades are real lightweight a lot of times. And but they they work. You know they work. At least it's permanent. It doesn't uh, change. So once you get this real loosened up, there comes a point where you can just shake it off. Uh, almost there, let's see.
I mean, I was shown how to do this by soil sciences from NASA, but he was worked, he worked with ice picks, which to me are just too slow. But if you have time, you know, you do it real carefully and don't break it too many roots, uh, the plant won't won't be in as much shock. But here we're, we got to go for speed too, because this can take a long time. So once it's loosened up, let me drop it a few more times. And yeah, this table is not breaking as much as I'd like to see it. I see some of them start doing that, and then they cut the knife and they start chase. It's a lot more good. Don't need that. Well, yeah, I wouldn't cut the roots with a knife. I would just try to get the soil off the roots. And if, you know, if you're going in the ground and you want to stretch roots straight sideways, that helps too. Keep, you know, the closer the roots are to the surface of the ground, uh, the more vigorous they can, you know, the better they can breathe and the more vigorous they are. You know, again, one of the problems they have with pots is they got holes at the bottom of the pot where they are to come in. So you get a lot of roots at the bottom where they shouldn't be. Most roots on plants should be near the surface where they can breathe better, but there's holes down here. So here's this little plot here. If you just sometimes do this. Now, I'm losing quite a bit of root, but plants will be fine. So when you get to a point where you just fold it and vibrate it, and then a lot, of, a lot of stuff just starts falling off. We don't normally do plants this big for our own purposes. We usually do the smaller plants because they're way easier. And you know, the difference between a one gallon boom I have back there on this, about five or six months of warm weather, they'll catch up. So, you know, so we try not, we tell people, you know, that's the smaller plants here. The big ones are not usually worth the extra money. If you have, you know, unless you're planning to die within a few months, you can, you'll live to see that one gallon plant uh, blast right by the, the five gallon one. So this is, uh, the one gallon root ball within the five gallon root ball that I'm working on now, it's a little denser in there. Again, once you're down to about this size, this amount of compost in the middle is probably not going to be that detrimental. Let's see if that will shake off. Sometimes you can. Tap it to make it rotate a little bit while you're shaking it, comes off a little better. We don't lose many plants. Now, we know what plants are real sensitive to doing this. Gardenias, uh, it's it's hard to fix I them. Say, are you sure? <laughs> I have a fruit tree that I need to transplant. But I don't think I can do that. I just think it would die. Like the guavas? Uh, I don't think guavas are very sensitive to this. No? Avocados. What Avocados are sensitive. Anytime you break up a root and you have a chance of of introducing a disease to the root. Now, some people like to dip this in a bucket of water to save water, but if you do that, just know that if there's a disease in there, it can transfer over the whole plant. So I do not like to dunk them in buckets of water unless you know that we know that bucket's clean and I have to clean it out between plants because if one plant has root rot, you can transfer to the next plant you put in there, so I'd rather not. 
And you know, this stuff, this compost stuff, if you have a lawn in your yard or a flower bed, just leave all the compost there. Those plants will love it on the surface of the ground. Okay, so this one, we, we lost probably over half the root system. So what I would do with this plant, in order not to let, let it loose. Now, when we did the ones out in the in front of the store, we just put them in the ground, left them there. And what they did is, within two days, they dropped all their leaves, and then it took them out two more weeks, and then they just took off. So a month later, they took off and just grew, and they and you know they grow so fast nowadays. They're we're always having to trim them, even in the middle of winter, we have to trim them because they're so vigorous out there in the native soil. But not all plants that we can do that. You have to know. Well, so far, gardenias have been, uh, and, and avocados have been our four success stories. Uh, um, well, I haven't lost too many other things at all. Well, guavas don't care about soil quality, so you don't have to do anything with those. You just, even if they're in compost, it doesn't seem, they don't seem to flinch. That family, the myrtle family, guavas and the myrtle family, none of those plants seem to have much sensitivity to compost around them. So apparently they don't need to breathe that well. So no need to put in the soil? Right, you just put them in the ground, water them a lot, guavas are happy. Same family as you can lift this. Eugenias, there's a lot of plants. So things like pines, junipers, palms, most lilies, most grasses. They'll look better if you take it off. However, not taking it off doesn't seem to hurt them that bad. Okay, so putting this back in, we're going to put it back in. Yes. Canadians are pretty sensitive too. Though. Yeah. That's why. Uh, you know, camellias that were grown, planted 40 years ago, look great. Camellias that are bought at nurseries in the last 10 years, not so good. We don't know of any growers who put them in the right soil. Um, Nuccio's and Altadena may do it right. I haven't been up close enough to see their stuff. They're the people who uh, introduced a lot of the communities to the U.S., and I think they still do it in the right soil. They don't sell good potting soil, but they, I think they actually grow their camellias in good soil. Uh, I've talked to San Gabriel Nursery about their zealous and camellias. I, so I, hopefully they understand what I was telling them. That's it. But it's hard to convince other nurseries that they're not, they're doing something wrong, so. Okay, so we get a little more of our soil out. We do so much of this that uh, we have a lot of techniques down now. Like when I, when I, Open up the bag. I don't usually cut this totally off because if I do, I got two pieces to pick up. Mm -hmm. If the soil is moist but not too wet, then it flows around the little roots better. So I don't like to work with real wet soil. Put this back in the pot. Usually, what I do here at the nursery is put the date on it just so I know. So usually I need at least two months in this pot before I can sell it to another customer. It takes at least that long to recover. I like to use these scoopers for potting purposes. You can buy them at Smart and Final. My dad had one of these back in the 50s and I used it up until just a few years ago. Someone stole it from us, but it was worn down to about here. And we like now this soil is 
decently damp, but still we'd like to get this watered within uh, 30 minutes of doing this. I like to do it immediately. I mean, if I had a chance, I would just run outside and, and water it down to make sure that it was dry. Now in the pot, you can tap the pot, make the pot, get that, that soil distributed well around the roots. In the ground, you can just hope for the best. And then I'll fertilize it. And now what we do here at the nursery, we'll put them in a half a day shade for two weeks. And that'll get over the roots will start regrowing at that time. And you, total shade is not good for plants. They don't get any energy that way. We've tried it in total shade outside, you know, so it wasn't pitch black, but in the shade, plants just didn't do well. They would just sit there or not, or even decline. So we get them in half the sun um, and they're good. Yes. There's people will tell you that you've got to press the soil down to prevent big air pockets, but. Well, that's Sorry, the, that's that true? no, that's the days when they used to think roots didn't like the air. Now we know roots want the air, that more airy, you can keep the soil the better. So they just say water, it'll let the water settle the soil, but don't, especially if it's wet, don't step on it. You can squeeze out all the air pockets, which is bad for the roots. So the more air the roots have, um, the, the more vigorous they are, the faster they grow. So on smaller plants like like this, this is easier. So this grower bought these little liners from a propagation nursery, which we do too. And this is just in peat and perlite. This little tiny little pot inside this pot is perfect. This is all filled with wood. And, um, uh, gosh, I can't see. We don't need permanent material in here at all. Well, no, we got some little piece of red volcanic rock. That might be 9%. Oh, there's not many pieces of volcanic rock in here. So this is from a, um, a soil company up north. And so I was talking to another company used the same soil. They said, well, this is not good soil. Uh, this is what you guys should be doing. And they went up to the, their soil supplier that blends this together for them. The soil supplier says, no way. Those materials, you know, pumice and stuff, it messes, totally messes up their blending machines. Mm -hmm. They rather use wood. It's much softer. It doesn't ruin their machinery. So that was their excuse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can't, it's hard to work with these people that, uh, that are following the leaders, which apparently are the universities. So, now, when I was first started doing this, I would notice that as soon as they got the soil off, the foliage color looked a lot better. I mean, immediately. It's like, okay, it was an ugly color before, and even before I planted, it, it already looks better. It's like the roots were holding their breath in this sewage that was forming around the roots. Uh. Now, a little original root ball is still there, but that's perfect still, so we'll just leave that alone. Heat and perlite, and then we have this. Um, we'll put it back in the Now, 
usually when I'm doing this, I'll put a bigger pot and sell for, you know, five times as much after I do this work. So, uh, but for now, we'll just put it back in the same pot. Of course, if I put it back in the same pot for the same price, I didn't make any money on it. And we're good. So now when you put this, so one of my friends who has an orchard uh, was planting some citrus trees and her one of her helpers bought the trees at Home Depot. Mm -hmm. I'm going, okay, that's not good soil. You should have bought from a uh, citrus store, but they already had the trees. So, you know, they were on the rootstock is decent, the variety was decent. So I told them, well, you just bare root them and put them in the ground. So they did. And what we, what I had them do, and this was in the middle of summer, just take our empty bags. We bought a lot of bags from us. So our empty bags and put stakes in the ground on both sides of the tree and put the bag upside down empty over these stakes. So it's like a little shade cloth. And so it shaded them on two sides. The sun came down, you know, well overhead in the middle. Not a single leaf dropped off those. So they, they did a good job. And they bare rooted the citrus, planted them in the orchard, gave them some shade during the day and they were off and running. Can you just describe that bag thing that you just said? Well, I just got the empty bag okay. and slipped it over two stakes. So the stakes folded, you know, so it's just hung over two stakes. So it makes a little shade on the, you know, I, they put on the east side and the west side of the tree. So it shaded for roughly half the day with the uh, empty bags. So did they cut one half of the bag or just lift the bag? Lift the bag like a bag. So just a bag, two stakes, drop the bag on top of it. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can do it. You can, you know, get one of those 10 by 10 canopies, put those can blow away in the wind, <laughs> and then set it over the tree. <clears throat> so if you do that with plants, you know, some way, like in my house, sometimes I'll just set a trash can next to them, and that'll shade them most of the day. If it's a short plant like this, you can just do that. Um, one time I just, I had a green belt next to me. I just cut some big branches off the tree and stuck them in the ground next to my plants. And it would give it filtered shade all day. There's a lot of ways you can do it. Just cut down the sunlight a bit, not too much. Again, if there's no sun on them, they just, you know, they can't do anything. They can't get any energy. Now, the vegetables in four inch pots are smaller. There's no reason. Plus, you know, these compost soils are definitely good enough for the life of the vegetable. Now, these the plants do well in here for um, the time that's the research shows five months. They got five months in here where they actually can grow. And then by eight months, it's becoming a death trap. Yeah. Yes. What do we do about plants that have been planted in the soil on the ground? Year after year, they continue. Mm, that's a good, and good question. So, I've done this. So, um, I'm speaking of begonias right now. Well, you can just dig those out, pair them, and put them back in. That that's an easy one. Just take it, take it all up, clean it all up, and put some fresh. Yeah, begonias are real sensitive. Like, Patients are not sensitive to compost at all. The donors are real sensitive to compost. They just they just get smaller and get into the top and go by some new ones. That, that's the other way to do it, right? Um, but I've I've had some gardenias in the ground. So what happened was my wife planted them before I could fix them. So they were in the ground and I couldn't get to them for a few weeks. So I just left them in the ground. And what I did is I just took a hand trowel 
and dug like this and pulled off that much dirt. And that was enough. Well, I did um, three out of four she planted. The one I didn't do eventually died. Uh, two of the three I did do made it. But gardenias are sensitive, so I don't expect to save all of them. But I, had, I dug underneath them and pulled it out rather than dig them out of the ground again. <clears throat> and I've done the same thing with camellias, uh, azaleas, and mango trees. I don't think I lost a single azalea or camellia doing that. Camellia seems to be really strong roots. Mangoes, no problem. I, I did it. What I did do on the mango tree that was bigger is I did one side and then waited three months and then did the other side. So I didn't do it all at once. Sometimes though, it is fine. Like people have citrus in the ground for a few years and are not doing well. What I do is tell them to, and they might be able to do this with water, just take a lot of the soil up near the top of the root ball out. You might be able to use this as a stream of water and you to get that compost around the crown of the tree out. So at least roots have a way to go from the trunk to the native soil without having to go through the compost. Because it's hard to work with the bigger trees that are in the ground, especially if they have a 15 gallon citrus in here. You get the top eight inches fixed, and that's probably good enough. The rest of this probably died already anyway. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, with citrus, usually if you don't fix them, they don't die. So when I was a kid, I remember my parents grew a lot of citrus trees in the 60s. They were already in, they were using compost, the citrus growers in those days. And they would sit there and get ugly for about three years. So they would lose branches, lose leaves, uh, get smaller and smaller for about three or four years. And they would level off. And then they would start to grow. And by the eighth or ninth year, they were looking really good. And I thought to myself, boy, that takes them a long time to get established. Because I didn't know anything about the soil in those days. Until the 80s, when I went to a citrus grower and got a treat from an actual commercial orchard supplier. It was planted in pure sand. And I put that in my yard and it grew three feet and had a crop that first year. Well, okay, there's something wrong with the citrus we're selling. But um, about 20 years ago, I decided to take one of these plants from the retail growers and put it in perfect soil in the ground and see what would happen. See if it, what my parents did, if it did the same thing. Yes, uh, I sat there next to my other good citrus trees. 10 years didn't move. This stayed like this big for 10 years, and then it took off. So it took 10 years for this composty stuff to stop being a problem. And then the, the roots recovered and, and it started growing. Will the roots grow beyond it? Yeah. Well, you know, you know, another interesting one we had, uh, maybe you might have heard this one before, but we were selling uh, trees from one of the big growers that were in bark, they had to switch from the best soil to bark because that's what their their new head grower told them was the proper way to grow plants. After that, we stopped buying plants from them totally. But I had sold this ginkgo to a customer in the bark and they had put it in the ground in this bark. And they said after five years, it hadn't grown an inch. So I said, okay, I want to see this. I, I, I got to see this. So bring it back to me. He brought it back to me. The root ball is still looking exactly like it did the day he bought it from us. And the roots were doing. The roots he brought back were doing this. They're just going outside the root ball and straight down the sides. So I put it on the counter and I tapped the root ball and it totally fell off. There was not a single root within that zone. It was all on the surface and down the sides. It was really interesting. And this was in November that year. Uh, the tree had no leaves and gone to sleep. So we put it in a, it was in a five gallon, but it wouldn't fit back in five because roots were sliding on the outside. So I put it in a seven gallon pot, put our soil around it, 
And the next month, in the middle of December, it leaked out and grew two feet. We were just amazed. In the middle of winter, it just took off and grew. Uh, we sold it the next spring. I mean, it, it grew fast. We couldn't believe it. Right in the middle of winter, it just took off and, and grew. Um, so we were real pleased with that result. Uh, but yeah, that thing was just sitting there with this dead zone in the middle of it. Five years, no growth, he said. I mean, I'm sure it grew an inch, but certainly didn't grow much since we had sold it to him. But we, what we did, we sold him a ginkgo that was field grown, wrapped in burlap. Uh, I just exchanged it for him. I said, yeah, take this. I want to see what happens with your tree. And it, and it, and it did well after we got that bark off of it. Okay, any questions? Yeah, so the main thing to do is start doing some of this yourself, especially if it's something we didn't grow. And uh, when you get comfortable with it, then you can, you know, at that point, you can grow anything. Everything becomes easier. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm.